Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ellie Berlin, and my guest today is also my friend and coworker. She's a chiropractor, and her passion is caring for infants, children, and new and expecting mothers. A club she recently joined, as she is 38 weeks pregnant now with identical twins. Dr. Suzanne Frank Mercer, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. All three of you. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> 38 weeks pregnant is far along for twins. Yeah, I actually am surprised, um, kind of surprised we made it this far, but they seem to be really comfortable inside. At the beginning, did your doctor have a prediction on like roughly what window the babies would come? Because like normal term with, I shouldn't say normal, but a term for a singleton baby is roughly 37 to 42 weeks. Um, the only thing he said, um, he's very easygoing. Uh, he said if everything looked healthy, that at 38 weeks we would talk about an induction. Um, but even that was up for discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Well, let's go back to the basics. Where are you from? I am from Florida, South Florida. You grew up in Florida. And did you leave Florida for school or you stayed there? Yeah, I went to um, – well, I went to undergrad at University of Florida in Gainesville. What did you study? Oh, go Gators. Um, psychology. And then I went to chiropractic school in Dallas, Texas. What got you interested in chiropractic? Because it's different than psychology. Um, I don't know. I grew up in a very medical uh, household, a lot of medical doctors in my family. And I always kind of knew I wanted to go into the healthcare field. And I started going to a chiropractor when I was 18. For something specific? No, not really for anything specific. Just, uh, I don't know. I wellness? Just, yeah, for wellness. Were other members of your family going? No, actually, which is weird. But yeah, I had, you just said I need to go see a chiropractor. I had always wanted to go. I actually was like a chronic cracker. Of yourself? Yeah. Okay. So um, I always wanted to go get it done from someone trained in that. And um, then I started learning about it more. How was chiropractic and school for you compared to what you thought it would be like? It was tough. It was a lot of work, a lot of hours. But, you know, we made it through. Yeah, a lot of people wonder what chiropractic training is like. I get asked that question a lot. And it's pretty intense. It's, uh, you know, a couple of years kind of like medicine of anatomy, physiology, microbiology, pathology, just a lot of human sciences. Uh, and then towards, at least in our program, towards the middle, you start learning more of the chiropractic sciences and, and how to apply them. Yeah, school was um, very intense. A lot of tests. We didn't have the summers off. You know, and then we have all of our board exams which, thank God, I passed the first time. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of them. <laughs> yes. Lot, like part one of the boards is part, six uh, tests all by itself. Yeah. And then there's part two, part three, part four, physical therapy boards. And it's a lot of test taking and studying and learning, which is great. I mean, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So. Did you go right into practice after school? I did, actually. I moved back to Florida, and I found my first job before I was even licensed, actually. So, I mean, I couldn't touch patients right away, but... Um, Just working in a practice? Was yeah. it a, a specific type of practice? It was a very high-volume practice. We saw about 500 visits a week. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the first day I did get my license, the doctor went out of town for three days. Holy moly. And he said, sink or swim. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I swam, I guess, although looking back six years ago probably could have done a little bit better, but... Well, so, um, I mean, yeah, out of the gate, that's you know, a lot. Got my hands on a lot of people right away, and I was there for about a year. That's what, I mean, the good thing about those high-volume practices, you really see a lot. You can pick up a lot in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was um, whole family, so like the whole gamut of people. Whole family, m m like From kids, kids to, to elderly. All the way to geriatric. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's, so you really do pick up a lot in that kind of practice, too. Yeah. Where'd you go after that? Well, um, I realized that was not how I wanted to practice long term. You know, I kind of, you know, on our breaks, he would time me and I would have to see people in like, you know, two minutes or less. Oh, wow. Which That's the downside of high volume practice. Yes. <laughs> um, not really my style. So I left there and then I covered practices when doctors would go on vacation. Oh, that's interesting. To try to learn about different styles, basically. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Your, your background is rich in like being able to pick up just a lot of experience in, in each of those types of practice, first in a high volume practice and then covering doctors because everybody's got like a different style on how they do chiropractic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some basic core things that we're all doing the same diagnostically and therapeutically, but there's different approaches on how to get them done. 
Definitely. Yeah, it's true. Uh, no two offices you go to will be exactly the same. Right. And so it's, it would be intimidating, I think, for me to go around covering other doctors because the patients have something that they expect that they're used to that is different from practice to practice. So you kind of have to go in and, and chameleon yourself. Yeah. Yeah, to a certain degree. But usually they know there's going to be a um, coverage doctor. So if they're still coming in, yeah. anyway, they're somewhat open-minded. Well, yeah, and they know it's not going to be exactly the same. Yeah. Oh. And then after um, that? After that, I – what did I do? Well, I worked for this other practice then, um, like as an associate – for not very long, and then I met my husband, mm -hmm. who is from California. Was that a pediatric practice? No, that was um, – it was not, although at that point I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. This one was just more – General. I don't know, kind of in the interim, I guess, while I was figuring it out. Okay. Yeah, this was uh, also, I guess, whole family where I was working. I, I really wasn't there very long. Okay. Because then I kind of realized I was going to be moving across moving the country. Moving to Cali. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, then I came out here, and I got hooked up with Dr. Berlin oh, yeah, with our, you. Our, uh, right. Well, your husband, now Willie, and I have a mutual friend. Now all of us do. <laughs> yeah. And um, he introduced us. And when I met you, I was like, wow, she's got such a positive energy, great outlook. And uh, you were so interested in working with kids. And our practice was mostly prenatal, so there were a lot of babies and toddlers uh, coming in all the time. And uh, I was thrilled because I do so much pre- and postnatal work. I was thrilled to be able to have somebody care for the babies who really was interested in doing that all the time. It was I felt it hard for me to split my focus, you know, to to because they're mm -hmm. they're so different from each other, pregnancy and, and newborns, for example. Um, and our patients love you, so it's great. But then you also got the pregnancy bug. <laughs> Yeah, I um I love doing the pregnant women and I love doing the kids and babies. It's just such an awesome population to work with. It's the happiest time of people's lives and you have to, you know, help them through that and enjoy it more. Yeah. Generally it's um they're happy and you know, I also think the things that come up during pregnancy that are specific to pregnancy, once you understand how they work, they're fairly easy to to get good results with. Um, and then also how much you can do with the body to help make the pregnancy more comfortable and functional and also in preparation for and sometimes during the birth because you also became a doula. Yep, I did. Um, I did my doula training about three, three and a half years ago. I guess I mainly decided to do that because I was working with so many pregnant women and I had never gone through it. So I wanted to understand more how to relate to them mm -hmm. and help them um, through it. Oh, and I think and, it was very beneficial. Uh, yeah. I remember we did a birth together. Yeah. At a birth center. That was a really the powerful water birth. birth. A water birth. And um, it was just a really good mix of energy. Um, there was the, the woman who was laboring and her partner. And then they had a doula, and she's a hypnotherapy doula. And she did her little, I don't know, Jedi magic <laughs> where she would just touch the third eye on the forehead there, and, and mom would just become very calm. And then... I think I was working on her back, and the midwife was sitting, sort of guiding her. <laughs> Mom was getting kind of impatient, and the midwife, do you remember this? She was like, uh, don't worry, the baby's just stuck in a little bit of traffic on the 405. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do remember that because uh -huh. um, she didn't seem like the type of person that would make a joke. Yeah, and no, she's very <laughs> so straight European. That really stuck out to me. She's like, she's she's on Wilshire. She needs to get to Santa Monica. <laughs> yeah, she's on a stoplight. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, and then Mom's like, is she here yet? Where's with her? <laughs> This is the worst traffic ever. <laughs> and then the baby came out. It was beautiful. That birth. was an amazing birth. And I've actually been working with the hypnotherapist during my pregnancy. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Oh, right. The hypnotherapist was the doula. Yes. In, in I, that one. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you started attending births and doing body work and doula work. Mm hmm Which also is so beneficial to women. So, yeah, I would go, you know, just for a few hours at a time, mostly not as a typical doula, and help with counter pressure and some soft tissue work and different um, modalities to help comfort them, basically, when, which I learned through you. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's always evolving. We learn every time we go, we learn more things. Yes, every birth is different, every labor, and it's exciting to see, and they're all beautiful. Um, when did you decide, hey, I'm ready to do this, I want to have a kid? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> this has been a long time coming. 
Yeah. So. And how is Like, it? probably, I mean, I've had baby fever for a long time, but we've been trying probably for, I mean, the not not trying stage for about three plus years. The not not trying stage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the trying for a year and a half plus before. Oh, so it has been quite a journey. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to remember going back in time, because once we got on the right track, it was, thank God, pretty smooth sailing for us. What made it the right track? Well, realizing that we needed help. Oh, um, did you have a specific thing you needed to overcome? Yeah. So um, when we weren't getting pregnant, we did some testing, and I got diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is very common. And surprisingly, no one had ever told me I had it before. During the period where you were not not trying and where you started to try actively? Yeah, or even since, you know, since I was like a teenager. How would they find it as a teenager? Just by like irregular periods or different symptoms that I had explained to people before, but they were just like, oh, everyone's different. Oh, and they never checked, they never yeah. like ultrasounded your ovaries or did no. blood tests or anything? No. Oh. So once you found that out, because it can it can get in the way of conception of fertility. Yeah. So um, we went to a reproductive endocrinologist who did some further testing, and he right away like knew what I had. And first, he suggested we try Clomid because uh, I found out that I wasn't ovulating at all, mm-hmm. oh, and wow. that makes it impossible to get pregnant, basically. Before that, had you done ovulation tests? I had, and they wouldn't come up positive, so, so I kind of kept telling clue. myself, like, oh, I must be missing the date. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So the tests were right. The tests were right. You were not ovulating. But I was like, oh, maybe it's just really early because my cycles are short or whatever. Yeah, you doubt that. You do. you start to doubt yourself. Maybe I'm not doing this right. Yeah. Okay. So I tried the Clomid, and nothing happened. You know, they ultrasound you and... Nothing was happening. Oh, they're looking to see if you're you're growing more mm-hmm. follicles. And I had a lot of potential follicles. They just weren't maturing. Okay. Glomid's an oral medication to mm-hmm. try to stimulate more follicle growth. Um, then we tripled the dose and still nothing. Ooh. Um, did it make you kind of like uncomfortable in other ways or did it not have that effect on you? Um, it did. I remember I was getting like hot flashes and... It's like hard to remember now what I was feeling then. So much has but, <laughs> <laughs> happened. Um, but yeah, I was getting like hot flashes and just, I think like random symptoms, probably like menopausal type symptoms. I don't know. Wow. But um, still nothing on the ultrasounds? No, nothing uh, nothing positive, I'd say. Okay. Except for knowing we needed to do something different. Right. Um, so we tripled the dose and still nothing. So my body was very resistant, you know, so we knew we had to go to the next step, which normally would be IUI, which is um, insemination. Intrauterine insemination. But basically the doctor said to me, we'd have to give you something so strong to make you ovulate that you might drop like many eggs Uh, and be at risk for like quads. So let's explain how this works. In intrauterine insemination, they would stimulate you to grow a bunch of follicles, release hopefully one or two eggs, and then take a semen preparation. And they kind of call it the medical turkey baster. They basically um, guide the semen right to where the eggs would be within you. But there's a lack of ability to control things. So if you drop a bunch of eggs and then there's a bunch of semen, then you can have lots of conceptions. (laughs) And um, I was not really uh, wanting to risk that. So... The next step is IVF, which you can kind of control how many are fertilized, basically, and how many are put in you because it's done in a lab. Right, so in vitro is done outside your body. So you harvest eggs and you take semen and then you can put them together and see what they do. And then when you have embryos on day five or day six, they put the embryos back inside you, but you can put however many you want to. Exactly. Within limitations. Yeah. So... um. For, there were a few reasons why we decided to just go straight to IVF, um, that being a really big and important one, I think. Um, the others being that I really like the idea of um, being able to genetically test. I think it gives good peace of mind. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I just wanted like the quickest 
route. I didn't want to have to try multiple rounds of anything else. So you did one round of IVF? So we got really, um, really lucky because some people have to do multiple rounds, which I don't take for granted. But our first round was very successful. I remember so. you came into the office and you're like, we have so many eggs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, even the doctor was surprised. I think I might have set a record. But they got 40, 46 oh my goodness, right. eggs from me. Um, a lot of eggs. Just crazy. And 38 of them fertilized. Wow. Which yeah, because normally of. when you have that a lot, they start to titrate down. There's 35 eggs, but they don't all look good. And then the ones that fertilize, now you're down to 15. And then, you know, the ones that grow over the next few days into embryos, and sometimes you're just down to one or two. But yes. in your case. And, um, yeah, I remember the day before the egg retrieval, I had to do the trigger shot, well, 36 hours before. And I was pretty good throughout all of the shots um, mentally. But that night, it was because it was an HCG shot, which is like the pregnancy hormone. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just shoot into yourself. Um, I was a nutcase. <laughs> after you did the, sh the shot? Yeah, like a couple hours after. I was just kind of hysterical, like crying a lot, hmm. like super hormone, hormony. Is that common with the HCG? Um, I think so. Some people, like the whole time they're on stims, mm -hmm. I think, react differently. Yeah. But I remember crying to my husband and saying, like, if this doesn't work, like, I'm never doing this again. Oh, really? You know, because it was, like, I was so uncomfortable that night. Well, and huge, because I had, like, 46 eggs in Yeah. Me. Was that overstimulation? Did you feel signs of overstimulation? Not at that point, but after the retrieval. You felt hyperstimulation? Yeah. Um, How many embryos did you have in the end? So on day five, we had 27. Wow. Which is... A so, lot. That's a lot of college tuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, we got them all genetically tested. Oh, wow. And then we were down to 19 healthy ones. Still a lot of college tuition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, thank, you know, thank God that we had a lot to work with because then it kind of eased my mind. You know, like if it doesn't work the first time we transfer one, then you got a bunch we have the backups. Yeah. You know. And you can choose if you want to put in one or more than one. Yeah, most doctors will let you choose. I mean, up to two, right? Usually, so because they don't always take. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make this cycle count, sometimes people will take two, with the risks of of having twins. But there's also a chance that one will and one won't, or both won't. Yeah. So it just increases your chances of getting into a pregnancy. So um, we actually made a very calculated decision not to put two in. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a really good idea to not purposely try to have twins um, with my first pregnancy. And I had all of these, like, dreams to do with my single baby, like, traveling easily and hiking <laughs> and baby wearing and, you know, like a non-hospital birth. So we put one embryo in. And at our seven-week ultrasound, we found out that it had split. Two babies. <laughs> Two babies. <laughs> was that a shocking moment? It was extremely shocking. I cursed a lot. <laughs> oh, you did? You're not the cussy type. <laughs> no, not normally. <laughs> um, yeah, because it was completely unexpected. I was watching on the sonogram while he's doing it. Wandering around. And I thought that I had seen two sacks, but I was like, no, I just don't know how to read them. Like, that's not real. And then, like, a second later, he puts away the wand and looks at the nurse and says, how many embryos did we put in? <laughs> <laughs> and my husband and I look at each other like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and that's when we found out. And my husband was cool as a cucumber. He was like, well, we wanted two kids, so there you go. <laughs> well, there we go. I was like, it's wow, well, you're not the, ones that the one that has to carry them. Yeah, so in that case, it's always identical. It's identical twins. Yeah, because they come from the same exact genetic material. So. Right, and you only put in one embryo. There's mm -hmm. no chance that two fertilized. No, it's... unless someone lied to me at some point. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so you have one, one egg that split, and then that makes uh, – twins and there's depending on how late that split takes place there's different kinds of identical twin pregnancies sometimes they're totally separate from each other with a separate inner sac separate outer sac and separate placenta sometimes they split a little bit later and they're a little bit more together so 
the placentas are different, um, and the inner sac is different, but they're in one combined outer sac. And then the later they split, the more conjoined they are. So they could actually both be in the inner sac or sharing the same placenta. Uh, and if they split even later, you can get conjoined twins. Where are you on that spectrum? Um, so we got really lucky with that, too. It must have split right away. So they're called di-di, so they have their own sacs and their own placentas. Right. That sounds terrible. But di stands for two. <laughs> Dichorionic <laughs> diamniotic. Right. Diam- Dichorionic, so they each have their own um, chorion, uh, was, and they each have their own amnion. Which is how um, fraternal twins are normally carried. Um, I think it's about 20% of identicals are carried that way. That way. But if and someone then, has them, I guess, not through how we have them, then they would have to get them tested after birth to, to find out if they're, they're identical. I- identical. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, and that's also the more the separate they risk. are, the, yeah, the less risk there is always. Yeah, so that was a definite plus. And yeah, after after the first day when I found out, I was so excited. It's like identical twins. There's nothing like it. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a wild <laughs> journey. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm just warming up with you. We're going to take a quick break, and I want to find out more about how your pregnancy has gone and what you're planning for your imminent birth. Uh, join us back here in just one minute on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and we're continuing our chat with chiropractor and soon-to-be mom, Suzanne Frank Mercer. Welcome back. Thank you. How's twin pregnancy been? Did you, as a chiropractor, you do a lot of prenatal care. Have you worked on twin pregnancies before? I have. um, Not a ton, though, actually. I mean, I only see maybe 12 or 15 a year, so it's, you know... I've been doing almost entirely prenatal care for the past 10 years at least. So it's not, you know, I don't see that many either, but compared to singleton pregnancies. Yeah, I've only seen a good handful, I think, in the past couple years. Yeah. So, but at least you have a, a reference point, meaning if you're working on them during pregnancy, then you kind of see how, how it is for other people going through it, how it is on their body, how it is on their mind. I've also... um as soon as I found out, I wanted to read everything I possibly could and about twins. twins. So I also joined a bunch of multiple Facebook groups and read on message boards. So well, that's nice that there's community that way that didn't used to exist. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. So, you know, I've even posted a couple times, like, I'm feeling this, like, was this normal or whatever. But I can also see what other people are writing. Um, and usually I think to myself, like, wow, I'm so glad that I have such good resources around me because I'm not feeling that way. Mm-hmm. How has pregnancy felt for you after watching so many people go through it? Um, I feel like I've experienced a lot of the symptoms, but for very short periods of time. It's been um, pretty easy until the past couple weeks. You don't hear that a lot, even with singleton pregnancies. Yeah, I mean, but it's true. You have first of all, you worked until nice depth into your pregnancy, and our work is pretty active. Yeah, so it's very active. You know, still traveling, and these babies have been to twenty concerts. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that helped, and I've been getting regular chiropractic care and massages and acupuncture. You have a record in our office for the person carrying twins who laid in the face-down apparatus that we have the longest. <laughs> I wish I still could. <laughs> I know. But, I mean, you just grew out of it like yeah. a week ago. Yeah, just like It's pretty amazing. Ago. Yeah. Um, I feel like there was a point where you just popped. <laughs> like you were growing, and, and even though you had twins, for the week you were at, whether it was 20 weeks or 22 weeks, you were so energetic and you were just – you didn't – I don't think anybody would look at you and say, oh, that must be twins. You're so right. Um, I was just saying that to someone. It was only like six weeks ago probably, maybe not even. Before that, you know, people would tell me, especially when they knew I had twins, they were like, oh, you look tiny. I'm like, well, I don't <laughs> feel tiny. <laughs> and then from one week to the next, I got in one day three times someone said, "You're you look huge. <laughs> you, <laughs> really? you must be ready to pop. And I'm like, nope. Oh, well. This makes um, me feel good because we had a little baby bash, and one of the little games that they played was taking a, a piece of ribbon and measuring your belly, right, and giving everybody else ribbon, and we had to try to guesstimate how big your ribbon was going to be all around your belly. So I thought I'll just cheat and put it around my belly 
<laughs> and I even made it a little smaller than that. I was like, nah, but it's Suzanne, so I'm going to make it a little smaller. And mine was still bigger than yours. So Aww. I came home and I was like, honey, I'm going to have to start juicing again. <laughs> <laughs> You're also like a foot taller. I'm carrying so twins. It's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you still, even now, just at 38 weeks, you just look like you have a lot of energy and um, you move around really easy. At least that's how it looks. Yeah, I make it look easy now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, during the day, I'm pretty good. Um, at this point, I'm trying to not do too much during the day. I'm just like letting myself do one or two like out of the house things a day because otherwise it just gets crazy and I get exhausted. Mm-hmm. And I'm taking really good naps. Like I took a two hour nap today. That was mm. amazing. And I don't know how I can sleep two hours in the middle of the day, but not at night. But nighttime, I kind of feel like a beached whale. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder. It's harder at night. Is yeah. are you getting achy sleeping? Um, this just happened about two weeks ago. It's just you know you wake up every hour to pee, but when you get up, it's like the belly is so heavy that it takes a lot of effort to get out of bed. So you like fully wake up. It's not like going to the bathroom in your sleep, and then like rebuilding the pillow fort when you get back. <laughs> the pillow fort. <laughs> um, and then you go back to sleep. But then you're up again like 45 minutes to an hour oh, later. Yeah. That does not sound pleasant at all. And so then like at 3 or 4 a.m. you wake up starving. <laughs> and have to get a snack and a drink of water. And then at that point I'm like, all right, well, maybe I'll just stay up until the nap time comes. <laughs> uh-huh. It's a lot to do. It's a busy night. <laughs> yeah. But during the day I, I feel pretty good. I'm watching a lot of uh, Netflix and Hulu. But, you know, still like this week I went – to the grocery store a few times, did Target. You know, I'm still, like, trying to do some things, like, outside because otherwise I get cabin fever. Yeah, I would. So a lot of people, I think, assume that if you have twins that you need to have a cesarean birth. Um, And I know that there's hospitals that mandate that. What kind of thought have you put into delivering your babies? Um, Yeah, I probably sounded like the crazy person at 10 or 12 weeks when I first saw my OB. Um, the first couple questions I had for him was what was his rates of cesarean versus vaginal for twins. And he's one of the um, more open-minded OBs, I think. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty honest with me and he said it's about a 50% rate. Okay. And then my next question was, do they both have to be head down or can just the first one come out uh, that's going to come out be head down? And he said that he's fine if just the first one coming out is head down as long as it's the bigger one. Right. I guess the concern with Breach babies, one of the concerns is that if the whole body comes out and the head gets stuck, then that could be a a significant emergency. But with twins, if the first one's bigger than the second one and the first one makes it out, there's the assumption that the second one will just come out or can be pulled out. Mm -hmm. So um, I was satisfied with both of his answers. Um, Otherwise, I might have sought someone else. Okay. Because I definitely want to try to have a vaginal. If I can avoid surgery, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so far, so good. Baby A is head down, um, has been for about three months. And baby Um, B? Baby B. (laughs) Baby B was for a little while, but keeps flipping. Right now it's transverse, um, so sideways, like right up in my ribs. That sounds comfy. And squishing my (laughs) stomach. Um, Is it hard to eat when that happens? It's hard to eat as much as I want to eat. Oh, right, okay. But it's easy to eat. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to breathe. <laughs> I can only imagine. I yeah. think normally at this point the baby like drops down and so women can breathe better. Yeah, uh, um, if it's a singleton, right? You get the lightning. Yeah. They call it lightning under your ribs where there's less heavy load because the whole baby's lower. So it's less heartburn, easier to eat, easier to breathe. But you don't get that. You have a whole second baby. No, it's under like there. a T in here. So this one's still, it's like, Sometimes you can feel its butt sticking out right under my left ribs. It's, How big are they measuring? They didn't measure last week, but A is over six pounds. I mean, these are all estimates, but A is over six pounds, and um, B should be right around six pounds. Oh, wow. That's healthy and so, a lot of baby. Yeah, it's a lot mm-hmm. of baby, a lot of fluid and baggage. <laughs> um, are there things that are different about the way they support vaginal birth of twins? So the, versus um, singletons? Yeah, which I don't love, but I know it's all for safety reasons mm-hmm. um, at the hospital. So 
And I'm glad I know about it ahead of time so I could get like mentally Oh yeah, comfortable those are not good it. surprises. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, the hospital says you have to deliver in the OR, even if it's a non-surgical birth. Because it's twins. Yeah, because one could come out and then you might need an emergency. Oh, I see. Um, C-section for the second one. So basically you can uh, labor in labor and delivery room. And when you're at 10 centimeters, they wheel you to the OR. Oh, wow. Which sounds really well, comforting be, and relaxing. Can you be walking around? Can you walk to the OR if you don't have an epidural, for example? Probably, I guess. You have all the monitors, but I guess if they let yeah, you take Yeah, you can off, walk yeah. around during labor anyway. That hospital um, where you are has uh, telemetry, so you, you can do wireless monitoring. Yeah, I was wondering if they would have two available for me. Oh, you know what? Actually, <laughs> now that you say that... Because I don't know how many they have of the wireless ones. <laughs> last time I, I did a birth there, they didn't ha- It's not that. It's a special unit made for twins. And they had slightly older equipment last time I was there, and they didn't have the capability to do the twin monitoring. Yes. I was at another hospital that did. It's one unit that monitors two babies is what they That's had. That's cool. And um, they were able to do wireless with the twins. No one mentioned that to me, but I hope we get surprised with it. Hmm. I don't know, because last time I was there, they were toying with new technology. Have you seen, like, the little Bluetooth cubes that they put on your belly? No. Yes. They have, like, these waterproof Bluetooth cubes that they put on instead of the big, heavy straps. And they um, oh, wow. They monitor um, by Bluetooth. And um, I wonder I, – so I know that they, they've been – Moving as new technology came out, they've been moving. But I wonder, but you can probably ask before you get there. Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. They have to twin telemetry. Monday. The other uh, requirement, or I mean, and you can deny, obviously you can deny anything, but they require you, even if you don't want an epidural, to get a port put in your back. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's so that if they have to do a C-section, like mm-hmm. emergency, that you otherwise would have to get put under general anesthesia. If they needed to do a quick cesarean mm-hmm. and they couldn't do a spinal quick enough, then their only option is to knock you out completely with a regular IV. Yes. So basically they say you have to get the port put in for the epidural even if you don't want the drugs. Okay. Do you which, want the drugs? No, I don't. But the part that I least like about it is the actual putting in of the needle and what about stuff. It? You just don't like needles? or Yeah. Well, and also I, I just I've... want to really like experience... Labor, I guess, is more. But the is needle more part, it. as a doula, have you watched them place the epidural? No, because usually they uh, kick us out. Yeah, usually only one person. So uh, uh, once in a while, I get to be there, and I will say the anesthesiologists at that hospital, they do this really neat thing. Maybe they do it everywhere, but they give you a tiny poke of like you lidocaine to nu- just numb your skin superficially, and then they go a little deeper, and you don't feel it because you're numb there now. And then put a little bit more. You don't feel it. I mean, you, <laughs> I I see people who are yeah. terrified. They don't want the epidural just for one reason only. They don't want the needle. They're afraid of the needle. And then when they end up getting it for one reason or another, they're like, oh, that was nothing. So yeah, my I, dad's actually an anesthesiologist. Oh. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> last time he was visiting um, was a couple months ago, and I had just learned about this protocol. Oh, I see. And so I – had him explain to me like quite a few times like the How whole procedure done. of it to yeah. make me like feel better about it. Yeah, I'm just telling and you, it did. I see them do it at the hospital and people are nervous about the needle end up not caring. And I assume if you're going to do a port, you'll probably do it earlier on when you're not in the more transitionary part of labor where it's harder to sit still for it. They just numb a little bit at a time. And after that first one, you don't feel it because they just make the whole path from just under your skin all the way to your spine where they're going to put it numb before Mm -hmm. they put in the actual bigger needle for the epidural. All right. Well, I hope these babies just come flying out and we we don't have time for that or for the OR. That could be um, good. If your chiropractor does their job. That would be the ideal situation. Um, Yeah, you know, we'll see. I plan to not get the actual drugs in it, um, but nothing's firm, We must have to test it, though. Like, put in just a small amount of drug to make sure it's in the right place. Maybe. You haven't talked about that that with them? I mean, I I assume once it's in there, you have to just give you a little bit to make sure it's it's working. But the hospital does walking epidurals anyway, so, you know, even if they put a small amount to make sure it's working, then you can still get up and walk around, and it'll wear off pretty quickly. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, we'll you see. can labor in a regular room. You get a port at some point, but you don't have to have the the actual epidural drugs in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to ideally labor through unmedicated. You want to feel it. Yeah, I, I I mean, this is likely the only time I'll ever experience this. And um, I want to truly experience the whole gamut. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've watched people go through natural childbirth. I have watched people go through it. I've watched people go through it that make it look, you know, not easy, but um, definitely doable. Very doable. And I've done, you know, the hypnobirthing classes, and I'm going to have a great doula with me. So I think I'm putting all the tools in place to make it successful. Um, so who else is coming with you? I have my doula and my husband and me. And two babies. And two babies. And Dr. Goldberg. And Dr. Goldberg. Uh, two pediatric teams. Two, there, there will be like 15 people in the room when I actually give birth. Yeah. Do you know? Did you know for sure that they'll let your doula in there when you're pushing? Yeah, uh, when I did my hospital tour, they weren't sure, but Dr. Yeah. Goldberg said as he long said, as it's I'll as long it. as she like as long as we don't put up a fight if it does have to be a C-section, oh, and yeah, that, she'll leave. Yeah, then they won't. Then it's sure. fine. As, but if it's uh, vaginal, even if it's in the OR, then she can be in there. Well, it's not just the OR; it's two babies, so they usually have extra pediatric people around, which it just becomes too tight of a squeeze. Oh, uh, yeah, she has I, to be in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I need her. Yeah. <laughs> What's her role in your mind? Well, she's there to help me and my husband and Willie. Um, but you made that sound like three people, <laughs> but Willie's your husband. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, she's there to help comfort me. And you know, even though I've been to labors before and I've been to labor and delivery in the hospitals, it's different when it's your own. So to help kind of keep my mind straight too, because she kind of knows what my you know, ideal plan is so she can help me keep me on track. Mm-hmm. Is um, it in your mind? So for the first baby, do you just address this as if it's a singleton labor? Yeah. And birth? And then what happens after that first one comes out? Um, I, I mean, I think they typically like to get the second one out within a certain period of time, which I haven't. There's no concrete answer to what that specific period of time is. Okay. But. There's no more. I, I mean, think. there's not. You're still ten centimeters, so you don't have to labor again. Yeah, but they say if you wait too long, then you could close oh, up. It starts to. Oh, you lose centimeters. So, <laughs> they say that could happen, but who knows? You know how long that would take to happen. And also, if baby um, B is transverse, do they just wait and see if the baby goes head down or butt down? Or you know, we were kind of talking about that at my last appointment. See, I thought, <laughs> I thought like gravity. Once there's all this space in your uterus, it would just kind of fall down. Right. But apparently, it can still, you know, float up there. Yeah. So um, they can try to turn it a little bit. Like do a an aversion. Almost like that, yeah. An external version. Well, there should be a lot um, of space at that point. Yeah. If you have an epidural, I guess it's because it might be really uncomfortable. They um, can kind of reach up. Vaginally. And grab the baby. Okay. Yeah. Fetal breach extraction, I think they call it, mm-hmm. uh, if the baby's breech. And uh, What about the placentas? When do they come? Is it one, one, then the other one, the other one? It's baby, baby, placenta, placenta. Oh, okay. The I placentas think. wait for the baby. And I think they typically give you some Pitocin um, after the babies are out to get the placentas. And, yeah. Are you going to eat your placenta? I'm going to get them made into pills and eat the pills. Are you going to separate the placentas? I don't... <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. However, they do it. Uh, no, I, I don't know how they do it with twins, but I'm just saying. Uh, I wonder if you could also make a tincture. I, I'm planning to make tincture too. So, I was actually, um, well, I didn't ask her if she wants it, but I'm making two sets of tinctures so I can give one to my mom. Oh, well, that's nice. Because I thought maybe, uh, you know, huh, can't hurt. Yeah, no, people save them. I mean, the tinctures last for a long time. So. Yeah, and it says that maternal um, line relatives can use. Each other's. Oh, wow. That's a really nice gift. Yeah. <laughs> I, no I don't idea. know how she'll feel about it, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I got you some placenta. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. I'm, uh, I'm really excited for you. Thank you. Why yeah, not? it's been an amazing experience. I feel very privileged to be able to go through this and grow humans. And I still can't believe there's like two babies in me. You're always – I say different things to different people because I'm face blind. I, as soon as my eyes are closed, I'm not looking at you. I can't picture your face. But in some people, I picture like 
certain emojis <laughs> and yours is like a smiley emoji. You're always so smiley and happy and friendly. Oh, thank you. And um, you've really made pregnancy and twin pregnancy in particular look just enjoyable and easy. It looks like something that's fun to do. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I make twin birth look easy. <laughs> I know. I'm wondering. <laughs> Will you come back after the babies are here and tell us how it went? Sure. When you get a minute? <laughs> yeah, once I regain my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> so in a year and after a half. After I eat some placenta <laughs> then. And, and some tincture. You know. Well, thanks, Doc. Thanks for sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Of course. And at home, thanks for listening. If you have a topic you'd like to hear, just send your suggestions to info at Informed Pregnancy. Dot com.